Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and it is my pleasure even more than I usually have on this stage to welcome you all today because today is the fourth annual Ojan O.K. Lecture on e Ethics and Economics. And in particular, we are deeply privileged to have Eric Rosengren, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston today, speaking on the topic of ethics and economics. Is the economy too sensitive to economic downturns? The answer, of course, is yes, but we'll hear more about it. Um, I, I will say a few words of very deep welcome and introduction for Eric in a moment. But first, I just want to take a moment, as we do each year at this lecture, to remember our dear friend John Olkay. John was a personal friend to me and many at the Institute, including others in the field, including actually Eric and Taruni Rosengren. Um, but he was also a very good friend to the Institute. John was someone who went across borders being born in Turkey, working in the UK, being a proud US citizen, um, spent time at, uh, briefly interacted with Brookings and then realized where the grass was greener and um, <laughs> ultimately um, was very involved as a consultant and advisor in informal form at a senior level to a number of central banks on their reserve management and on their policy issues. And he and his wife, Phoebe Miller, who's with us today, um, both maintained a very active intellectual and cultural convening life, uh, particularly in the areas of financial regulation and central banking where they both maintained professional interests. It was through that that I got to know John and Phoebe, but I have been very grateful to count them as among my closest friends. Um, when Phoebe and I came up with the idea of having this lecture created in John's memory, it seemed like an obvious thing to do because he loved the Institute, he loved intellectual discourse, and he cared very deeply about this intersection between eth ethics and economics, um, and uh, particularly in the monetary financial sphere. And I'm very proud to say, thanks to the donations of many here in the room or many watching, we have this annual fund. It is one of two annual named lectures we have at the Peterson Institute the other being the Stavros Niarchos Foundation lecture we give every year at the time of our board meeting. This, in its fourth year, uh, the three previous speakers were George Akerlof, the Nobel Laureate, uh, Sheila Baer, the former chair of the FDIC, among the many other distinctions, and um, Alan Blinder, the former vice chair of the Federal Reserve Board and uh, faculty member at Princeton. And um, that's a pretty good list. Um, speaks well of John, speaks well of the Institute, but mostly speaks well of the speakers that they wish to reach a broad audience on an applied topic of ethics and economics and make a strong public statement. And for that reason, I am particularly pleased to have Eric Rosengren today. Um, Eric, as I've indicated, I have a great personal admiration for, um, but it is not me alone. This is a widely held admiration. Eric has been president of the Boston Fed for going into his 11th year next month. Um, he rose through the ranks of the Boston Fed after joining in 1980, it was 1985, right? Yeah, um, after p finishing his PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, importantly, uh, starting about 20 years ago, he and his frequent co-author Joe Peake, now also at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, did an incredibly influential set of papers, very empirical, uh, looking at the banking crisis in Japan, its transmission to other countries, including the U.S., and this set of papers was not only groundbreaking at the time because it gave real empirical meat and tactic, tra excuse me, tractable insight into the real mechanisms of the credit channel and monetary policy, but also proved to be prescient as an important issue of how the financial crisis came to Europe and the US. And Eric, to his credit, in his role, various senior roles at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and then especially after becoming president, 
in 2007 and as a member of the FOMC, spoke out well ahead of the overt crisis, warning not just in a sort of passive, something bad will happen, but in a very specific, thoughtful way, if you go back and read the transcripts you will find, as well as in his public statements and research, about what were the risks. And he did so, I know, not just from an intellectual position and not just doing his job well, which of course it was, but because of his deep ethical conviction that he did not want the people of the US and the people of the world to suffer through the consequences of those kinds of downturns. Eric has continued to be an intellectual as well as a uh, public service leader in his role the last several years under his guidance and that of his excellent research director at the Fed Boston, Jeff Tutel. The team there has done some incredible work, again, at the intersection of banking, real estate, and issues of financial stability. He, Jeff, and I think Joe, was it, did a very provocative paper that frankly I think deserves more attention than it got a couple years ago about the idea that the Federal Reserve has shown uh, large regard for financial stability issues in its monetary policy decisions in the past and should do so. Um, so I am, again, very thrilled for all of you, for the Institute, and for me personally to have Eric Rosengren give the fourth annual O. John O.K. Lecture, President Rosengren. A very nice introduction, so thank you very much. And actually, Adam covered my first slide to some respects. So I did know John personally, which is why it is so nice to be here giving a talk in his memory. And I first met John actually at a dinner with Ben Friedman in 2007. And that dinner went really well. We were both students of financial markets. We loved talking about financial markets in Europe and in the United States. And he would periodically come to the United States and especially to Boston. And whenever he came through town, we'd sit and we'd just have a breakfast or a lunch. And those discussions, became a little troubled as we went from 2007 to 2008. We were observing what was happening in the economy and what was happening in financial markets. And one of the things that was really clear in those discussions was how worried he was about the implications of having a financial crisis and what it meant in human terms. And so it's fantastic to be able to talk about John and have his family here. So it's really wonderful uh, that they have this uh, set of speeches in his memory. And I would say that my topic today actually follows from those discussions, which could we do more to make sure that whenever that next recession occurs, and I'm not predicting a recession in any specific time, but whenever it does occur, are we appropriately prepared for that? And it's interesting because I do think that that's somewhat of an ethical issue. And when I was first talking to Adam about doing this talk, ethics and economics is actually something you don't hear too often. So my daughter just graduated from medical school, and they take an oath that highlights ethical standards that you're going to have in medicine. It's kind of an unusual oath to a Greek god that no one believes in. But nonetheless, it's an oath that does talk about thinking about the ethics to be a great doctor. Psychologists talk about it when they talk about design for various projects. Geneticists talk about it with all the decisions that people have to make. But economics tends to be very mathematical tends to be driven by equations and maximizing behavior. And you actually don't see courses on economics and ethics, which I think is kind of interesting. And in fact, the only time I can remember when I was going to graduate school and teaching at the undergrad level, that ethics sometimes came up in the last week of the first year, and it usually wasn't covered on the exam. So I think there has been an underweighting of, ec of ethics and economics. And so I think it's great to have this kind of lecture series that's really focused on that topic. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about what the distributional impacts of economic downturns are. So I think everybody realizes that recessions are bad outcomes, but we sometimes don't focus on the distributional effects and how bad the outcomes are for certain groups of individuals and how systematic that has been over time. So I think it is important for policymakers to think about those distributional costs, particularly if those people are not in a very good position to actually weather those costs. So I'm going to focus on three examples. I think there are plenty of other examples that you could use, 
but I'm going to talk about uh, state and local spending, which frequently doesn't get that much attention. I'm going to talk about regulatory policy, which you tend not to think about in this context. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about monetary policy, uh, the last two being the areas that I have the most expertise in. And let me just start by saying that focus on a problem can make a difference. So if you look at this chart and kind of put your right hand up and cover the right hand side, you can see that inflation from 60 to the mid-1980s was highly volatile. We got periods where it was very high, it came back down. You put your left hand up and look at the right side of the chart, it's a very different process. This doesn't look like it's the same inflation series between the right half and the left half. And I would say that the fact that central banks got better at focusing on inflation, that we had an explicit inflation target, that inflation expectations have become well anchored, and that in most places in the world, central banks are fairly independent of the political process, have all played an important role in making sure that series looks different now than it looked before. But if I look at unemployment and go through the same exercise, if I put my right hand up, and ask, does the left side look dramatically different than the right side, and then put the other hand up and look at the other side, it's not as obvious that we've made as much progress on something that arguably is much more important. So the Fed thinks about both inflation and unemployment and has to worry about both those elements in the dual mandate. We've made significant progress on inflation, but arguably on the unemployment rate, there's a lot more work to be done. That's not just up to the Fed. There are lots of different policies that could mitigate the business cycle, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So what are the consequences of not mitigating downturns? I'm just going to highlight a few, but there are a lot more than what I'm going to emphasize. One is that different racial groups tend to be disproportionately impacted. The other is that people with lower economic education tend to be disproportionately impacted. And finally, children tend to be disproportionately impacted impacted. So those are three groups that I wouldn't necessarily would want to see being disproportionately impacted by economic downturns. So let me just go through a couple slides. Um, so this just shows the unemployment rate series. So the blue line on the bottom is the overall. The gray line is the Hispanics and the greenish line is African American. Now I think everybody in this room probably knows somebody that was severely impacted by the financial crisis. I personally know people that became unemployed. I know family, the broader family members that experienced a, a bout of unemployment. We got unemployment rate up to 10%. So it really was a very significant negative shock to the economy. But if you look at how high the African American unemployment rate gets, and you see the gray shaded lines, you can see that 10% is a good outcome if you're African American and experience a recession, and that it's not on unemployment. So they are disproportionately being impacted relative to the rest of the population. A similar, though slightly uh, less severe outcome occurs if you're Hispanic. Turning to educational attainment, if you look at the bottom green line, which are people that are highly educated, bachelor's degree or higher, yeah, the unemployment rate went up, went up to 5%. Still seeing, you know somebody who was unemployed? That was a very significant outcome. But if you look at people with less than a high school diploma, the number was 15%, a dramatically different outcome. So it's not just that recessions occur and they're bad. They occur and they're bad, and they're particularly bad for certain groups of the population that can least afford it. And certainly I would include children in that. So this shows two different uh, lines. Note that there are two different scales. So the green is the poverty rate of children and is on the right scale. And the left is the unemployment rate, which is on the left scale. And you can see that during periods where the unemployment rate is quite high, you also see periods where the poverty rate of uh, children is also quite high. So it's obviously a group that can't do much about recessions and outcomes, but the fact that so many are deeply impacted by recessions. And this is just getting at the poverty rate, but there are obviously many other things that happen when people become unemployed in terms of what happens to their future earnings, what happens to their health, what happens to their marital outcomes. So this, I don't want to minimize how severe these outcomes are. So given all that, are we doing enough 
to focus on uh, how we could mitigate it. The first area I want to focus on is state and local government spending. So state and local government spending, you tend not to think about it in terms of a macroeconomic goal. When governors and legislators and mayors think about how they're doing their budgeting, they don't really worry about whether they're pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical. States tend to have a balanced budget requirement, which makes sense because you want to make sure that they're able to pay off the bonds that they use for the various projects they're doing. But it does have an implication. If you have a balanced budget amendment and a lot of your revenues are highly cyclical, it means you're going to be reducing government spending in the local area at the time that you least want it to happen. So the focus tends to be on the federal fiscal policy. But if you look at state and local spending as a share of GDP, it's actually a very big category. It's 11%. You compare that to the housing sector, which is 4%. We spend a lot of time thinking about the housing cycle. And if you look at the federal government spending, it's 7%. So it's a, a category that is major enough that we should care. And this follows the same pattern as that previous chart in terms of the state and local government spending is in green here. The unemployment rate is in blue. And so if you look at periods where the unemployment rate is very high, you also see state and local government spending tends to be very low. We're following a pro-cyclical policy. You also see that when the economy is doing quite well and the unemployment rate's quite low, you tend to see a lot more spending at the state and local level. This is just to say that this is pro-cyclical. State and local government spending, we haven't really focused on this as a macroeconomic issue. But this isn't kind of a rule set in stone. This is because we've chosen not to focus on the impact of state and local spending being so pro-cyclical. Now, we have an unemployment rate that's 3.8%. This would presumably be a time when you would expect states' financing would be improving, and states would take an opportunity to actually do better uh, and over the last five years, we've seen the unemployment rate come down quite dramatically. But what you actually see is the downgrades are much more prominent than the upgrades. So rather than getting into better state and local fiscal health, we have the exact opposite. Now, there are a lot of causes for that. Certainly one of it is the fact that a lot of the uh, implicit pension guarantees that states have have not been fully addressed. And a lot of those downgrades are those states, so states like Illinois and New Jersey, Kentucky, or states at all, at least in part, have a pension problem. That but nonetheless, it makes them very poorly positioned for the next economic downturn, because they're already going in in a situation where their finances are not in good shape and where they have to have a balanced budget, so they're likely to dramatically cut government spending whenever we do have that next recession. So what could you do about it? Well, there are different ways you can structure the tax code that focus on whether it's tied to be pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical. So when you think about property taxes, that doesn't tend to move dramatically over the business cycle. But there are other elements of tax revenues that can be highly cyclical. Now, this certainly isn't to consider. A lot of things that the local government should think about when they're thinking about the structure of taxes. But we shouldn't ignore the effect of having code that's highly tied to the cyclical nature of their revenues. That more than likely results in spending cuts in the economic downturn. And you would think one way to solve that is what some states have are rainy day funds. But two things about rainy day funds. One, they tend to be really small, so they don't actually provide much of a cushion, though in concept they could. Uh, the second is that many states used up their rainy day funds and haven't replenished them. So even though we're at 3.8% unemployment, the economy's doing quite well, GDP's growing quite strongly, um, it's not a situation where they're replenishing their funds in a way that minimizes the risk that the next time we have an economic downturn, they're going to be forced to cut government spending. And employment at the local level from government workers is actually fairly important. So there are a lot of competing goals for state and local financing. But it is a choice about how we set up the financing and rainy day funds in a way that I don't think we've spent enough time thinking about the macroeconomic consequences of how we've structured things. The second area I'm going to talk about is bank regulation. I'm a former bank supervisor. I headed the bank for Bank of Boston. And I certainly appreciate that we want liability of financial institutions. So prudential regulation 
is really important. You don't want financial institutions being in a situation they can't meet their obligations when we have an economic downturn. But the structure of that can matter. So the typical structure for bank regulation over the last 30 years has been a capital ratio. And it's pretty simple. We have a capital on the top, an asset on the bottom. Let's say a bad outcome occurs, collateral values go down, I increase my reserve for loan losses. In other words, banks are experiencing fairly large losses. How does the bank react? Well, usually the last thing they do is raise capital unless they're forced to by the regulator. That's because they don't want to dilute existing shareholders. And so, as a result, they tend to leave the capital at whatever it is. So instead, they focus on shrinking assets. Now, shrinking assets is, in effect, exporting their problem to their customers. So the assets, for the most part, particularly when we have a lot of liquidity regulations, is that they're really not going to be selling um, government securities. Instead, they're going to be shrinking their loans. They do that by raising the credit standards and making it harder to get a loan, or they change the price of the loan. They increase the margin that you get on the loan. So the typical problem that we have is that during financial downturns, particularly if collateral values are dropping, is that the capital ratio causes institutions to shrink at the very time we'd actually like them to be expanding their balance sheets. This just shows you the non-performing loans and the unemployment rate. So the non this is the opposite in terms of this chart in that a high non-performing loan is a bad outcome. That means you're having an uh, increase in your loan loss reserve and you're reducing capital. And you can see that in both the financial crisis, but also in the 90s that uh, dramatically affected New England, non-performing loans got quite high at the exact same time of the recession. And how did the banks respond during that time? They shrunk their assets. In New England, we certainly heard in both recessions concerns about credit crunches and the inability to get financing that were more related to the problems of the borrowers, or more related to the problem of the lenders than the problem of the borrowers. So we have a bank regulation that makes sense we're shrinking at the exact time that we don't necessarily want to be shrinking. This is a complicated chart. I'll try to make it very simple. There is an alternative way to do it, that is to have understanding capital charges. So what's the basic idea here? The dashed line is just showing you what the capital ratio is. And by assumption, if you look at the far left rectangle, we're assuming that they're trying to be 2% above the minimum standard. We have a shock so that they lose 3% of their capital. Their minimum capital standard now falls below the capital asset ratio, and they just go through the exercise I was just describing. They shrink their assets in order to meet their capital ratio, which has an impact on borrowers. Now, there's another way to structure it, and that is to create something called a counter-cyclical capital buffer. So if you look at the, the third rectangle from the left, you can see the CCYB. What that is is increasing a capital buffer during good times that you explicitly reduce to zero during bad times. So what happens if we increase the countercyclical capital buffer to three times? Now there's a buffer of five and a half percent. Same shock, you have a three percent shock, but now you're above the minimum capital requirement. You don't have nearly as strong an incentive to shrink your balance sheet. So we could structure capital regulation in a way that doesn't have the same kind of cyclical feature, or at least to the degree that it does. Countercyclical capital charges have been adopted in Europe and Hong Kong. They've set their capital charge at a non-zero rate, so they've been building it up during good times with the expectation that it would actually decline during the bad times. In the UK, they've actually used it in that way. But in the United States, we've left it at zero. So we're not building up the capital buffer now, so we're not going to have the ability to reduce it if we end up having a negative shock. So one way that bank regulation could be less pro-cyclical is to change the way that we think about the capital regulations so that banks don't have as strong an incentive to shrink when they're bad economic times. So the counter-cyclical buffer, I think, would be something that is on the books. We could do it. The way we have structured it to date, and Chairman Powell was asked about this at the conference, it has been designed to really be when asset prices are viewed as very negative. This is arguing a slightly different view of what the counter-cyclical capital buffer should be, that it truly should be a buffer 
that we can change when we have those bad economic times so that the financial sector doesn't aggravate the kinds of recessions that we've had in the past. Now, the one area that I think has truly been counter-cyclical is Usually it's the policy of last resort. Everybody else goes first, we go last. And if we're in an, a period of high unemployment rate, the typical thing to do is to lower interest rates. And that's what this chart shows. So you can see the blue line again is the unemployment rate on the left. And the green line this time is the federal funds rate. So there are a couple things to notice. First, the last recession that was quite severe was the one period where we couldn't continue to lower interest rates. We hit zero that time. A second thing to note is how much the federal funds declined around that recession shading. So the typical recession, you're declining short-term interest rates by 500 basis points. So we weren't able to do it enough in the last recession. Now that's not to say there isn't any other policy that we can follow. So we did expand the balance sheet. The balance sheet, I think, had a very significant impact on the economy. But nonetheless, it's probably not the preferred tool. It's certainly not the politically preferred tool, even if it is the economically preferred tool. And I think most economists would argue that we don't have as much historical experience, the relationship's not quite as clear, and that to the extent that we can, we should rely on the federal funds rate or short-term interest rate movements rather than the balance sheet. So this shows you what the committee, every, uh, quarter, we're asked what we think the federal funds rate will be in the long term. So if you look at 2012, it was a little bit above 4%. Obviously, we're not very good at estimating this because it's been going down over time. That does tell you something about how good we are at thinking about the equilibrium interest rate. This is a, a concept that's not really observable. And it's trying to get at what is the interest rate in which monetary policy is not being accommodative or restrictive. So the big standard errors around our ability to estimate it. And you can think about it in the long run, you can think about it in the short run. Overall, the committee has decided that that rate has, seems to have come down to roughly a little bit under 3%. So if you think about how we normally react to uh, recession, the normal reaction is to reduce by 500 basis points. And we think in the long run, we're only gonna be around 300 basis points. That means that we have to assume that unless something structurally changes, we're gonna be hitting the zero lower bound more frequently. Now, monetary policy can't really affect some elements of why the equilibrium interest rate is so low. It's driven by factors in the economy like productivity, which is not something that the Federal Reserve controls. Certainly demographics, so what is population growth? I don't think anybody would argue that monetary policy has a big impact on population growth. So those are factors that we have to just take as given. The only other option you have, if you're worried about what the level of the federal funds rate is, is what the inflation rate is. So one reason the equilibrium rate is so low is we're in an economy with low productivity, low population growth, and low inflation. So of those three, the only one that monetary policy can directly affect is inflation. So one alternative that has been suggested by a number of people, and there was a Brookings discussion about this around eight months ago, was to have more flexibility on our 2% inflation target. There are a number of proposals. I'm not going to go into the details of that in this discussion, but I think it certainly warrants a broader discussion of whether we want more of an inflation range than a 2% inflation target that's quite specific. That flexibility would give us the ability that at times when population growth is low and demographics are such that we actually can partially offset that by aiming a little bit higher in the range that we're trying to get the inflation rate. And if we turn out to be surprised and population growth or, or uh, productivity is much stronger, then we can choose to be a little bit lower. Something that I think at least is worth discussing a little bit more. This next chart uh, is just emphasizing something about current policy. So the I guess the tannish line is where the natural rate of employment is according to the Congressional Budget Office. The green are the periods where we're above that estimate. The blue or the gray are the periods where we're below. And at this time, for some reason, uh, they couldn't do an additional shade that 
So you can see the kind of uh, veiled lines there are the recession periods. And something to note is that when we fall far below what we think the natural rate of unemployment is, we tend to have a recession not too far off. Now, it doesn't have to happen. In some periods, it actually did get much lower. So if you look at 65 to 70, that was a period that had stayed low for a fairly long period of time. But it was at a cost. That's a period where inflation started to pick up. Now, the 60s are very different than now. There are lots of structural changes that have occurred in the economy, a lot of uh, differences in labor, the labor union movement and other factors. But the fact that we had a very expansionary fiscal policy, an unemployment rate that got very low, was the first time that we started seeing inflation pick up. From 60 to 65, it was basically 1% inflation. It slowly went up from 65 to 70. And then we continued to have a problem through the 70s until Chairman Volcker uh, took on the issue more directly. So I'm not viewing this as just a wage and price pressure. I'm also viewing this as imbalances in the economy more generally. So those imbalances can occur in terms of pushing labor markets too hard, or it can occur in that you're pushing asset markets too hard. But if you have big structural changes and imbalances in the economy, the ability of the Fed to just fine tune it isn't all that great. So when you look at the periods where um, interest rates were rising, I don't have the Fed funds in here. In general, you don't see a lot of times where we get up to that tan line and we just stay at the tan line. Usually when we start raising rates, we go much, much higher. Those are recessions. So we do need to be mindful as we're pushing the economy relatively hard right now that what we really want is a long and sustainable recovery. We want to avoid the outcome of having severe recessions like what we had in 2008. So I think correcting imbalances is something that we need to keep in mind. I really do want to have a long period where we're recession free for all the reasons that I talked about earlier. And I certainly think that if we don't do that, we should certainly be thinking about all the other things that we could do to cushion the blow a little bit more. So my concluding observation, costs of economic downturns are very high. And in fact, I view it as an ethical issue because it disproportionately affects groups of people that can least insulate themselves from the kind of outcomes that are occurring. They tend not to have much wealth. They don't tend to have much insurance. They don't have the ability to cushion themselves. So we have to worry about the distributional impact if our policies are designed to actually aggravate the business cycle. In my view, we actually do have ways to mitigate it. I gave three examples. I use state and local government. You could also use federal government spending, not just state and local government spending, as thinking about do we have enough buffer, do we have enough cushion that whenever we have that economic downturn, it can help insulate the blow. Same thing for regulatory policy, same thing for monetary policy. It's really about saying when is the time that we should be raising our buffers. I would argue when the unemployment rate's at 3.8%, that time is probably now. So I'll stop there and be glad to take questions. <laughs> yeah, I think you get one too. My playing with audio equipment always makes great TV. Um, no, thank you, Eric. That was sensational. I should just uh, let you know a couple ground rules. This is obviously on the record. Eric's speech was released by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston when he gave it. Um, Eric also did an interview with a news outlet this morning that's currently on the web. Uh, so our Q&A will be shorter than usual. No reporters are allowed to ask questions. If you ask a question and you're a reporter and I, you somehow were not recognized me as such, you will not, your question will be ignored and we'll move on to the next normal person. Um, uh, 
I mean, Eric's responses are all on the record. This is not to be mean to reporters. This is not a Trump operation. This is because, as you all understand, he wishes to focus on the long-term substantial issues he's advancing today and not be answering questions about the short-term outlook or about Fed short-term policy. Is that a fair statement? Fair statement. Okay, great. However, as chair, I get the privilege of asking a couple questions first. Um, you, you said to me at dinner last night, probably just out of courtesy, um, you know, I was wondering if you gave this lecture, what would you say? And I would have started the lecture in probably with not as good graphs, but in exactly the same place you did about the distributional effects of monetary policy. And um, so I want to first push you a little bit further on that. So famously or infamously, uh, former Chair Yellen gave a speech on inequality at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and was, um, I think unfairly, but anyway, in some quarters disparaged for taking on that topic. Um, I am hopeful you, in the sober way you put it, with just the facts, will not be disparaged for taking on that topic. But there is a sense in which the Federal Reserve seems to feel that they cannot the group as a whole, the institution, cannot really speak out about inequality issues because we must maintain the notion that, we're, that the Federal Reserve is setting policy for some aggregate, some representative actor. Am I exaggerating the sense of constraint here, or do you think we could see a day when multiple Federal Reserve officials start talking about distributional effects of monetary policy? So we do have a dual mandate, and it isn't focused on distributional requirements. So we want to get the dual mandate right, but this is really a risk assessment. So how hard are you willing to press for what you think is, say, maximum employment with the possibility that you might be shrinking the time that you actually avoid having a recession? And so in the dual mandate, there's no variable for risk. And I actually think risk is an important component that we should think about, including the risk that recessions can have very bad outcomes, including distributional. So we're not targeting the distribution, we're targeting the overall inflation and unemployment, mm -hmm. but we have to be mindful of what the costs are when we get something wrong and take actions to make sure that we're minimizing that risk. So to me, this is a risk assessment, knowing that the cost can be very large, on particularly from the distributional impact. And so it shouldn't cause us to have a different constellation of inflation and unemployment, but it might say that when we're doing a policy, we ought to take that into account and think about the risks of the, the tail event. And I think this is a very important time to be thinking about tail events. And so when we're thinking about tail events, you think about the distributional impact when you're figuring out what the loss function is. It shouldn't be ignoring the distributional consequences of our decision. Um, continuing in that vein, I mean, you were very careful in a good way. You're very clear in your definitions. You're not getting out in front of your data. So one thing I noticed was when you talked about the distributional aspects, you didn't make a point of what we would call scarring or hysteresis, that the, you know, unemployment definitely goes up much higher and faster for, for people of color, for minority groups but you didn't make a point that it has persistent lasting effects. And to be fair, our colleague Olivier Blanchard, who was one of the originators of the idea of hysteresis, has recently been looking at this and finding, to all of our surprise, there doesn't seem to be much evidence of that. Um, I know you think about these issues, so just a little bit on, do you think that's a settled thing? You know, are you, that it's terrible, but it's not, scarring, persistent unemployment, how much does that matter? Would it matter if the evidence came in differently on that point? So evidence always matters. Um, but the degree of scarring, I think, is an open debate. And I have seen work, including staff done by researchers at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, that actually do find a fairly significant impact and what they do find is that if you have a spell of unemployment early in your career, the likelihood that you're on a different trajectory is much 
higher than if you didn't have that spell of unemployment. I haven't seen Olivia, I haven't read that paper, so I can't comment directly on his work. Um, but I certainly don't think it's settled. And I can just talk to some of the people I know who've been unemployed and what their outcomes have been, which is qualitative, not quantitative. Mm -hmm. It seems more consistent with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston studies. So let's go back to the mandate. <coughs> um, as you said, dual mandate. Um, and in your monetary policy recommendations, you talked about regard for get, getting trapped in the zero lower bound. But even within a dual mandate, we still think in terms of the relative weighting of stabilization of inflation objectives versus stabilization of output objectives. And me, with my personal biases listening to you, would say it seems to be a logical consequence of your talk that we should actually be weighting output stabilization more than inflation stabilization. And this comes from two things. Uh, first, just the, the distributional and then scarring and all this case that you made. But second, as you mentioned, I think entirely justifiably about the pattern of inflation, the period of vastly accelerate, fastly vastly accelerating inflation was a limited point in the Federal Reserve's history. And most of the Federal Reserve's history, we haven't seen that. So is it possible to think in terms of a mandate that more explicitly talks about the relative weights of full employment versus inflation stabilization? Is it desirable? I mean, we know that there are people like John Taylor who will tell you that there is a clear weighting in, in the Taylor rule for why you want to be much more aggressive on inflation. Is this an argument we should reopen? So if we were following a Taylor rule, we'd have much higher interest rates right now. Correct. And I think one of the reasons for why we've had a policy of being very gradual in increasing the rates is because we haven't seen much of a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So if you're in a world where that trade-off isn't all that big, then you react differently than if you think it is really big. And just looking at the inflation graph with the unemployment and recession shading, yeah, the economy and the structure of the economy don't seem exactly the same as they were in the 1960s. And that gives us the luxury to be more gradual. And I think there's some real benefits to being gradual because I think if we're gradual, we're less likely to make serious mistakes. You have more time to evaluate what the impact is because we think that there's a low equilibrium interest rate it means you don't have to get nearly as high as if the equilibrium interest rate was four and a quarter, for example, which was where it was at the beginning of the chart, then we'd have a lot further to go. So I think it is important to think about where the economy is and how significant that trade-off is. Some of the recessions that occurred during earlier periods were us allowing inflation to get out of control and reacting to that. So I think the central bank did play a role in some of those recessions. You could argue that some of those recessions including the Volcker period, mm -hmm. it was by intent, and it was to bring inflation down. So I think we do need to think about, is inflation picking up faster than we think? We have not had a period where the unemployment rate has gotten as low as it currently is and is likely to go. So at 3.8%, you have growth rate that looks like it's going to be more than 3% this quarter, 3% for the next couple of quarters. Potential is probably a little bit below 2 that tells you that the unemployment rate's probably going to go down. So you're going to be in a region that we haven't had a lot of historical experience in. That's where the risk assessment comes in. And thinking about, are wages and prices going to pick up more than expected? Are, are there kinks around get really pushing the market very tight? We have three states in New England now that are below 3%. Um, that's a very low unemployment rate. And you do hear about the difficulties that occur from employers when they're in that position. They start having to raise wages. We haven't seen wages go up very rapidly yet, but we have seen wages slowly going up. Now, what happens over time? These things don't happen overnight, and we tend to want to see effects right away. Most of these effects actually take quite a bit of time. So I think we need to think about what these trade-offs are. We have to think about, at this particular time, how important is it to focus on inflation or unemployment. If you really think expectations are very well anchored, then you may be willing to take a little bit more risk on the inflation in order to, uh, in, in that circumstance. If you think that inflation is likely to pick up really quickly, you might not be as tolerant. Let me continue to push you a bit, but I do want to stay away from the specific decision um, at present or in the near term. 
So um, you talked about the structural changes in, in the economy and colleagues of mine, including Joseph Gagnon and Olivier Blanchard and others and Jamie Cohen-Saton and others here have been trying to contribute to this discussion of is there a kink in the Phillips curve, when should we see it, et cetera, and so on. Um, but one of the things which, of course, you're aware of and which I ran into when I was at the Bank of England is that, at least in the US and the UK, there's not only been downward pressure on wages during the recession, there's been a secular ongoing significant decline in the share of national income going to labor. Mm -hmm. And not just is this a substantive point, but in modeling terms, and we have Dave Stockton and Mike Prell here, and they can tell me more about this than I can, but um, in modeling terms, that was one of the ways, at least as I understood, we used to close our macro models, was you'd assume that over some long run, there would be a reversion to the mean of the labor share versus the capital share. Anyway, so leaving all that aside, or not leaving all that aside, <laughs> taking that as the foreground. Mm -hmm. You know, when a central banker is evaluating how much wages should go up, how much do you allow for the idea that, hmm, maybe the labor share should rise against the capital share? Or at least we should not have an opinion against the labor share rising against the capital share. And if that's something you're concerned about, how do you operationalize that beyond saying, I mean, this is a genuine question. I'm not saying I know the answer. And how do you operationalize that? Because, you know, inflation of 3.5%, if it turns out it, it goes to wages and decreases capital share, just like the reverse happened 10 years ago, that may not be inflationary. So how do you think about that? So there are other variables I'd be looking at at the same time. Certainly one of them would be productivity. Right. So if we're in a world where we're being very productive, then low wage growth is a problem. You want the wages to go up. If you're in a period of very low productivity and wages are growing much faster than productivity is, at some point you would expect that first firms may respond by shrinking their margins and that would start getting at the allocation between capital and labor that you're talking about. But at some point they're gonna have to raise prices and they probably aren't going to continue to have their margins shrunk. Right. And at that point, that's a point where it should be of concern. So we can certainly observe profit margins. We can measure, not particularly well, but we can measure productivity. And we can certainly observe wages. So, and they're different wage measures, so none of these are perfect measures and some of them can only be measured over long periods of time. But I think you have to look at the constellation of variables and asking, do you think that the set of variables are moving in a way that are going to be inflationary over time, mm -hmm. in which we're going to exceed what we've said we're going to do for the dual mandate? Let me conclude my talking with, with two questions about the remaining pegs of your policy proposals, or at least policy ideas in your very far-sighted speech. So we already talked about monetary policy. I want to commend you for raising the issue of state and local finances, because as you say, people lose sight of the fact that it's 11% of GDP. It's very important. And again, I have to tout some of my colleagues who've been trying to work and work on issues of redesigning automatic stabilizers, both in the US and Europe. And I take your remarks in that spirit. Mm -hmm. um, but th there is a whole literature of political economy that, that says it's really dangerous to let state or especially local governments uh, have, any, have any room for play. And, you're, and I think the people from that point of view, people who are genuinely fiscally responsible, would say, well, I'm not sure you can change around the pro-cyclicality without ruining the balanced budget. <laughs> in fact, or, or another way of putting it is, if I'm cynical about state and local government political economy, this is the best we're gonna do. I accept what you're saying, but this is the best we're gonna do. So beyond an appeal to state and local politicians' higher natures, which might be higher than Washington politicians' higher natures, but let's, let's assume they're not infinitely high, how does one get the state governments to do what you want them to do, to pay down in good times? So there are rainy day funds. So there have been rainy day funds historically. Um, we were in a better position in many states going into the last recession because they did have a rainy day fund that they could tap into. 
many of those states have chosen not to, to replenish. Um, there has been an emphasis, just like there has been at the federal level, to reduce taxes. But there is a cost, and so I think this would be a good time to put more pressure on thinking about what is a reasonably sized rainy day fund if you want to avoid very significant fluctuations in your state, and state employees are an important constituent among that. So uh, thinking about state employees and how they're thinking about their employment contract I think is an important part of the mix. And I would say that there are a number of states that have made promises that it's less and less certain that they're going to be able to keep it. And so when we think about the pension liabilities that they have on their books, I think this is a good time. The stock market's high, the unemployment rate's low. It should be a period where we're having more of a discussion about replenishing the funds for those promises that we've already said we're going to keep. So unless you're going to renege on them in some way, it's a liability that doesn't go away and probably will only get worse with time. So I'm just pointing out that this is the time that you would actually expect it to do. Now, I can't, I'm not going to opine on how likely it is that it's going to occur, but we can't just say that very large cycles are an act of God. They're an act of choice if we have ways that we can address it but choose not to do it. And for state and local government, there are lots of other things that they have to think about, but I think this probably gets too little a weight. And so my remarks here are trying to emphasize that this is one of many ways that I think we can address some of the cyclicality that we're likely to encounter. And if we don't take actions now, particularly if you have a monetary policy that has a little bit more difficulty offsetting in the future, you could be hitting periods of very long, low interest rates. And they're undesirable features of having that kind of outcome as well. Great. My final question goes to an area where you're one of the world's great experts, which is this interaction between bank standards, capital, lending cycles, and what now is called macroprudential policy. So you made the case for what's called countercyclical capital buffers. So just for the edification of our audience, myself included, I, I want to ask you two questions about that last chart with your bars. Um, the first one is, you make the, intuitive the intuitively appealing assertion that the um, dotted line, which is the capital standard, actually does matter a lot, that it's kind of a cliff edge. Um, is that really the empirical reality, or is it that um, banks, many banks, when there's a downturn, they're just going to shrink balance sheet no matter what unless they're gambling on resurrection. It doesn't really matter what the fine point of the, the capital buffer is. Or am I totally wrong? Is it really that there is a cliff, and if they're at 0 .0, 0 0.2 above that buffer, they won't shrink lending? So it's not as stark as my example. My example was a simplified example. Um, Clearly, the closer you get to a threshold that matters for regulators, um, the more concerned bank management's going to get. But falling below, now that we have a stress test, has clear consequences. Mm -hmm. That will be that you can't issue dividends, that you can't buy back stock. So in effect, that's forcing them to raise capital. We haven't had this regime in the past, but I do think that Banks are very attentive to where they are relative to their capital ratio, and with a little bit more margin, they have less incentive to shrink. If they're below it, it's not only that they may want to shrink, it's that you might have an enforcement action and other actions that actually actively encourage them to shrink. So part of the supervisory process when an institution no longer is meeting their minimum capital standards is normally their ratings go down, so they get a, a CAMELS rating of three, four, or five. With that usually is a legal agreement that actually requests them to improve their capital ratios relatively quickly. And if you're trying to do it relatively quickly, the easiest way to do it is shrink. So I think part of it is that um, the supervisory process actually, I think, reinforces their concern about falling below that dotted line. Now, where you are and how high that buffer is is somewhat of a management discretion, how likely it is you think that you're going to end up being below. But I don't think any management team is going to say that they want to be below that dotted line. Fair enough. Let me open it up to questions. Again, with no disrespect intended, the proviso, you must not be a card-carrying member of media to ask a question. Please identify yourself. There is a roving mic up here. Uh, 
Jess, could you go to the gentleman at the second table and then to Joe? Uh, Prakash Langani from the IMF. Um, I, I had two questions unrelated. Uh, the first one, I, I, I agreed with what you said about the fact that from a risk perspective, you would want to be alert to the distributional impacts of monetary policy. But isn't there a, an even more stronger first order case, namely that the transmission mechanism of monetary policy could itself depend on the, on the distribution? So the impact of interest rate changes on aggregate demand in many models will depend on what the distribution is. So to me, that makes an even stronger first order case for always worrying about what the distribution is. Uh, and, and then everything that you said makes, makes the case for being alert to distribution even stronger. So I wondered if you would agree with yeah. that. Let me answer that before you get okay. to the second one, um, which is I, I agree that the distributional impact does matter. So marginal propensity to consume, for example, matters. And depending on where you are in wealth, can have a big impact on how responsive you're going to be to either a tax cut or monetary policy or other features that might relax some of the constraints. But that's basically a given. We start with when we're setting monetary policy, the distribution's kind of given. And so this is saying actually, so I agree that it's important for the modeling of transmission mechanism, but this is arguing more on terms of a, whatever that distribution is, we should be thinking about those consequences on the tail end of the cycle. And so I agree with your point, but this is, I think, uh, an additional point related to that. Your second question should be brief, Prakash. Yeah, uh, very sort of more speculative. I mean, you talked about the scarring effect when unemployment goes up, uh, when it spikes up and, and stays uh, high for long. Is there evidence of uh, something in the reverse, an uh, anti-scarring effect when unemployment is way below the natural rate and stays way below. Um, uh, do good things happen? Do people accumulate human capital? Do they get deliriously happy? I mean, and is that a case for, is that a case for, uh, you know, keeping unemployment low even at the risk of some inflation on the downside? Yeah, so where we think the natural rate of unemployment is, is an unob unobservable. So we don't know exactly what that number is. If you think about where the committee thinks it is, which is in the mid fours, and we're looking like we're going down to the mid threes, nobody has an estimate as low as the mid threes. So I think there is a good reason to probe, but a bad reason to plunge. Of course, there are some of us not on the committee who have an estimate below that, but you know, we, we're irrelevant. There may be other <laughs> <laughs> estimates, but yeah, so it is estimated with a lot of error, and, we, and it moves over time. So just like that equilibrium interest rate moves over time, people's estimate of what full employment is moves over time. I would say both those estimates seem to move much more than the underlying when we look back over time. So we shouldn't always assume when the economy is doing well that necessarily the natural rate has fallen by the same amount. And that's true for the equilibrium interest rate as well. I mean, I don't think these unobservable variables that we estimate particularly well, the standard errors are huge. So if you put the standard errors on there, it encompasses much larger than what, what I'm talking about. But nonetheless, I think you're taking on more risk the further you, away you get from whatever your best estimate is. Okay. Uh, thanks. I'm Joe Canio, a senior fellow here at, at Peterson. Um, so my question it sort of takes off from the first question for Crash just asked. Uh, and Eric, we were talking just before your, your speech about uh, quantitative easing. One of the criticisms of quantitative easing is that it's bad for income distribution. It sort of benefits the rich more than the poor. I guess my, f so the first part would be, do you agree? I mean, monetary policy in general tends to raise asset prices, so is quantitative easing any different from conventional monetary policy? Uh, but whether or not it is, um, the second part would be. That part. Oh. Um, so I actually, there are, the way quantitative easing does work is it does encourage asset prices to go up and not everybody owns assets. So in that respect, it does have a distributional impact. But the biggest distributional impact of somebody is that they become unemployed. And so if you think it's stimulative monetary policy, and I actually do think it's stimulative monetary policy, 
you can't move the short-term rate, you should move the long-term rate and quantitative easing is the mechanism for doing it. And a period of very, very high unemployment rate is much more costly to those people at, of low and moderate income. And they tend to be the people most indebted who are most likely to benefit from the fact that interest rates go down. So think of a car loan. If you get a floating rate loan on a car loan and it's quite low, it makes a big difference to whether you can buy that car. So there's the reason we lower interest rates during the sad economic times is because it does help people and it particularly helps people that are at the low end of the distribution. I think the same thing's true for quantitative easing. So it's true that there is an asset feature to it that also benefits people on the upper income that hold stocks and bonds. But I think the first level effect is that it stimulates the economy in a way that reduces the period of very high unemployment rates. Sorry to interrupt you, but I did want to get oh, no. to the second part. And Joe, again, your second question has to be very brief because he's an official, so he actually does have to leave when it's time to leave. <laughs> well, it won't surprise you that I fully agree with that. But the given the macro stabilization benefits you just said, which help uh, low-income people, there still is a question of how you deliver the macro stabilization. So would that be any reason to consider QE versus some kind of uh, monetary fiscal coordination or some kind of raising the inflation rate so you don't have to use QE, you know, because all those could deliver macro stabilization, which would give the benefits you just said, but might have themselves different distributional impacts. Yeah, ideally when interest rates get very low, it should be a time that we're having more expansionary fiscal policy. Our ability to do that will depend on what the debt to GDP is the next time we have a recession. If the debt to GDP is very high, the likelihood that we have a very large fiscal program to pull us out, I think, is diminished. Not zero, but it is reduced. That is a concern. So just like the state and local government ought to have a buffer, the federal government ought to be thinking about buffers as well. And so I agree with you that actually it would have been ideal to have a better fiscal monetary mix during the last recession. We had it for a little bit of the recession, but not the whole recession. We probably could have used a lot more fiscal stimulus during that time. And so uh, if you're confident that in the future we will be able to have that fiscal stimulus, you maybe not have to deal with quantitative easing. I guess I have not a whole lot of confidence we'll be in that situation. Great, we're out of time. Um, thank you all very much for joining us this year, as ever. Thanks to our friends who are watching online. Uh, thanks especially to Phoebe Miller, uh, Charlotte O.K. Hoagland, Nick Hoagland, the family of O. John O.K. for having worked with me in the past and to create this series and being such staunch supporters to be here again this year. We're delighted to share the occasion with you, especially for someone who not only was a friend of John's, but someone who so clearly today in his remarks tackled the very spirit we intended for this lecture. I am grateful to Eric for joining us here at the Peterson Institute today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.